there's not a lot of subjectivity when it comes to airfield planning. This is Rob Hoxie, a veteran airport planner. He's helped on airfield projects across the globe, from Portland, Oregon to Abu Dhabi. Now, he's here in Chicago, leading the Aviation Department's development projects. And if we look here at a layout of O'Hare... O'Hare, which Airports Council International ranked as the second busiest airport in the world by aircraft takeoffs and landings, has just completed a more than 15-year-long modernization project that's transformed its airfield and its 14 and a half miles of runway. One airfield on the north, one airfield on the south, and the passenger terminal complex in between. Hoxie's here to explain how airfields are mapped out what factors planners must consider in their design, and how all of this impacts your on-time arrival. So the three primary things that we look at in starting to plan an airfield would be runway orientation, runway length, and overall runway configuration. Uh, that is how runways are configured proximate to one another. Runway orientation pertains to how the runways are um, situated relative to compass heading. Whether north-south, east-west, northeast-southwest, northwest-southeast, the direction of the runway is determined by the wind. In Chicago, our predominant direction of wind is either westerly or easterly. Um, so having runways on an east-west orientation uh, makes a lot of sense here. Um, if you look at a place like Dallas-Fort Worth, um, you end up with wind conditions that are predominantly out of the north or the south, and therefore the runways want to be oriented in a north-south direction. The reason? Headwind. Planes function best when departing and arriving into a headwind, as it helps give departing planes lift and slow down arriving planes. Tailwinds and crosswinds, though manageable, can impact aircraft performance, making takeoffs and landings tough. To determine prevailing wind direction, airport planners consult historical data. We look at, on a per hour basis over at least a 10 year period, what direction winds uh, were blowing from, uh, at what speeds and velocities, you know, both kind of steady state as well as gusts. The target, according to an FAA recommendation, is for the primary runway to provide at least 95% wind coverage. In a windy city like Chicago, that's not possible. The airport has to be prepared for shifts in wind direction. O'Hare has enough periods of the year where winds either blow strongly out of the south or out of the north, that it also needs coverage um, with runways on a diagonal. We have two runways that we term the crosswind runways. That is, they are used when the crosswind component, either out of the north or the south, is too great to be able to operate effectively on the east-west oriented runways. Before O'Hare's modernization began, it had a triangle shape, including northwest to southeast runways. But with more data, the team was able to make changes. The four new runways that we've opened all are on an east-west orientation. Uh, 10 center, 10 right, 9 center, and 9 left were all opened as part of the O'Hare modernization program. The next thing that leads into airfield planning is establishing how long runways need to be. Runway length is not uniform across airports. The type of aircraft an airport needs to accommodate and the local weather conditions factor heavily into how much pavement is needed. And it's not even the same for arriving versus departing flights. The arriving flights generally land with low amounts of fuel than the weight of the aircraft and the weight of the people on board. At O'Hare, right, we accommodate a range of different aircraft types from regional jets to the biggest of aircraft with you know, more than 400 passengers on board and, and a lot of fuel. That aircraft's overall weight and the airspeed at which it's traveling into its touchdown are put into a formula that also takes into account local weather conditions. When one goes through mathematical calculations of all of those different parameters, we arrived at 7,500 feet as the ideal length uh, for an arrival runway. O'Hare now has three 7,500-foot runways, which are all primarily used for arrivals. Departing runways, remember, are different. It's your long intercontinental flights that really drive your departure length uh, requirement on an airfield. Fuel is the major variable, and the weight of the fuel means that the plane is heavier, and so uh, with a heavier plane, it requires um, a greater length to achieve the airspeed that ultimately allows it to uh, take flight. The result? Longer runways for departures. At O'Hare, that meant building one runway 13,000 feet long. That's more than two miles in a straight line. That wouldn't cut it at Denver International, however. That airport has five 12,000-foot runways and one stretching 16,000 feet, making it the longest commercial runway in North America. 
Anytime you have a hot and high climate like we have in Colorado, uh, runway length is generally longer than it is for an airport at sea level and where uh, temperatures overall are uh, more moderate. Finally, planners need to place the runways, and where the pavement goes is crucial for traffic flow. We first look at you know, what is an hourly requirement for arriving traffic? What is an hourly requirement for departing traffic? And if you merge those two at the same time, what's kind of our total two-way requirement at any given point in time? At O'Hare, arrivals alone can reach 114 flights per hour, which meant placing those runways further away from the terminal and the primary departure runways closer. And importantly, it meant creating more parallel runways. If we look at O'Hare's old configuration, the intersecting runway configuration essentially degrades how many flights per hour could be accommodated on a single runway. That's because landing on one runway becomes dependent on another runway being clear of aircraft to avoid any chance of planes colliding. The results of this reconfiguration plan have largely untangled the runways from one another and given us much better balancing of a good weather arrival rate and a bad weather arrival rate. And ultimately that leads to the stability for our airline partners who operate here. They no longer have to cut 20 flights from their schedule per hour as soon as the clouds show up in O'Hare. O'Hare says it will eventually be able to land four aircraft simultaneously, which would make it the first commercial airport in the country to allow for this. The point of all of this work, whether it's O'Hare's modernization or the construction of a new airfield, is to move more travelers through the airport in the safest, most efficient way possible. Prior to the modernization plan, in good weather, O'Hare would land this runway, this runway, and this diagonal runway as one of its configurations. With that, the airport could achieve an hourly arrival rate uh, in the low 90s. If we were to add a fourth parallel approach, that would increase the arrival rate into the upper 130s to the low 140s. But as many travelers know, this kind of efficiency isn't always achieved. Delays happen. That's something that has plagued O'Hare and other congested airports around the country for the better part of several decades now. Since O'Hare opened its first new runway, it has cut the more controllable system delays by more than 60% compared with the five years prior. Still, Department of Transportation data shows the airport is trailing the average on-time arrival rate for all major U.S. airports so far this year. We can't control all forms of delay with infrastructure, right? You still may be missing crew, you still may have a maintenance issue affecting a flight, and there are other factors as well. But for the addressable delay, that is what we can build our way out of, um, we've made significant strides uh, to improve the traveling experience.